<laughs> See, when I get to sit down there, I get to do your part in it. <laughs> That's all right. We need to be reminded that God is mm -hmm. our everything. Amen. 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 My Lord. Um, thank you, choir. Thank you, choir, for wonderful, wonderful worship this morning. Amen. Yes. Father, we ask that you be present in this preaching moment. We can lay aside just for a moment the things that trouble us and sometimes keep us tangled up and tied up and unable to fully experience you. God, we ask that you bless this message and that you open it up for each and every one who is here. That there might be some kernel of truth that speaks directly into our circumstances. For we know that you are light and love. And you seek to bless us all the same. Now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight. O oh Lord, our strength and our Redeemer, in Jesus' name, amen. Our scripture lesson for today comes from the first book of the Bible, Genesis, Genesis chapter 50, and we'll be reading verses 15 through 20 from the New International Version. Ask that you read that along with me. When Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, What if Joseph holds a grudge against us and pays us back for all the wrongs we did to him? So they sent word to Joseph saying, your father left these instructions before he died. This is what you are to say to Joseph. I ask you to forgive your brothers the sins and the wrongs they committed in treating you so badly. Now please forgive the sins of the servants of the God of your father. When their message came to him, Joseph wept. His brothers then came and threw themselves down before him. We are your slaves, they said. But Joseph said to them, don't be afraid. Am I in the place of God? You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. The word of the Lord. Amen. 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 We want to pray for just a few moments on thought. It's time to forgive. It's time to forgive. Our scripture lesson today focuses us on some very pivotal and important verses that are a part of the final chapter of the book of Genesis. And some of these verses, this chapter, may be familiar to many of us, certainly those of us who studied the book of Genesis in Bible study. In fact, these two verses, two of the verses that I read, are two of my most favorite verses in all of Scripture. Because they seem to encapsulate in a few short words the entire message of the book of Genesis which is the book of beginnings, the beginning of the human race, the beginning of the Hebrew race, but also the beginning of sin. These verses at the end of Genesis, the book of beginnings, take every story we have read from Genesis, every encounter, every outcome we encountered, and every loose end that was laid open in the passages of the book of Genesis, and it wraps it all up and ties it up in a neat little bow. And then it seeks to refocus us on what really matters. 
One of the most important messages of the book of Genesis is found in verses 19 and 20, where, G, where Joseph says to his brothers, who were fearful of what Joseph would do to them after their father died because of what they had done to him many years before, when he says, don't be afraid. Am I in the place of God? Am I your judge? I hear him saying, am I the one who issues judgment against God's people? Then he says there in verse 20, you intended to harm me, but God intended it for my good. To accomplish what is now being done, which is the saving of many souls. When you begin to read the book of Genesis, you will encounter the first introduction to sin to violation of the principles and the established order of God in the Garden of Eden. From that point forward, as you observe the progression of events, you will see that the string of sin seems to run completely through every story you read. The theme of sin and deception, dishonesty, and lack of integrity is all throughout the book of Genesis. Folks started lying to each other in the beginning. Folk wanted to kill each other in the beginning. Family members slept with other family members, hallelujah, in the beginning. Parents showed favoritism to certain of their children in the beginning. Children tricked their parents and parents tricked their children and the list goes on and all of this happened in the beginning. But not only was the string of sin running completely through every story, but we also observed that the hand of God was also present and working in spite of every plot and every scheme. God made a covenant to Abraham back in Genesis 12, and he renewed it in Genesis 15, and he promised Abraham that he would give him land and all that he needed, and that he would make Abraham's people a great nation. God promised that he would keep his covenant with Abraham's children and all of his descendants, and God was faithful to his covenant as he kept it with Abraham's son Isaac and Jacob and down through Joseph and those who came after. So God's hand continued to be on the first family of the covenant, but we learned that even in their favored position with God, the family indeed had a lot of issues. A lot of problems, and a lot of deception, and a whole lot of sin. When we were studying the book of Genesis in Bible study a year or so ago, we began a discussion on family relationships as we considered the complicated, fractured, and challenging family relationships in the book of Genesis. And we began to look at our own families to see if there are any similarities to some of the challenges that the Israelite families faced in the Bible. And although our issues are somewhat different in nature due to the difference in time and lifestyle practices, we did find many similarities. We found that there indeed still is some favoritism in our families. We found that yes, there is some deception in some of our families. And yes, we even found that there is jealousy, competition, and hatred in some of our families. And most of all, we found that there is a lack of forgiveness still operating strong in our families. Now, to be sure, the people in Genesis had to forgive a lot of things, but we learned that Cain never forgave God for seeming to favor his brother Abel, or Abel, for be, he never forgave Abel for being the object of God's delight. And instead, Cain killed Abel. Mm -hmm. Leah and Rachel, who were sisters, fought over the same man. And they never forgave each other for being married to and loving that same man. Jacob and Esau, brothers, and, uh, who were brothers and the sons of Isaac and Rebekah, spent 20 years estranged because Esau believed that Jacob stole his birthright and took his favorite place in the family line. So Jacob feared what his brother might do to him if he ever encountered him again. And don't forget how Laban tricked Jacob into working for him for some 14 or so years just to get Rachel 
Laban's daughter, the wife he fell in love with on first sight and was willing to sacrifice anything for. And in this story that we're looking at today, Joseph's story, Joseph's brothers, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Issachar, Zebulun, Gad, Asher, Dan, Naphtali, and Levi hated their brother Joseph. So bad that they offered him up to slavery and turned their backs on him, never looking back to rescue him because of their jealousy and their disdain for the one who God had given a powerful vision. All the many stories in Genesis alone demonstrate to us that there was much to be forgiven in these families of God at the beginning, and much of this continued on until the end without anyone trying to make things right. To forgive is commonly defined as to pardon or to exonerate or to show mercy or to give a reprieve, to stop feeling anger towards someone who has done something wrong, to stop blaming, to stop requiring payment of something that you feel is owed, to give up your right to get back at somebody for the wrong they've done to you. The Bible speaks clearly and loudly to us about our obligation and our responsibility and the privilege that we have to forgive those who have wronged us. We have discussed this before, we've studied it before, and we should be very familiar with the scriptures on forgiveness. God instructs us in scripture to do the things that are pleasing in God's sight, to forgive others as, as God has forgiven us. And God instructs us to do this because our forgiveness of others is designed to bless us and keep us in perfect peace as we keep our minds stayed on Jesus. You see, when we lose our focus and we begin to turn our gaze away from God and onto the one who hurt us, we tend to forget that it is only God who has all power and it is only God who can fight our battles. It is God who promised us in Romans 12. He said, vengeance is mine. I will repay. God instructs us that we are not to seek revenge on those who harm us, but to turn it all over to God and let God make it right. Never forget that it is God who truly loves us unconditionally. And if God be for us, who on earth can be against us? Amen. Romans 12 also instructs us that when we are faced with our enemy, the one who we feel has wronged us or is out to get us, he says, do not repay evil for evil, but be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. So, so, if our enemy is hungry, what are we supposed to do? Yeah. Give them something to eat. If our enemy is thirsty, what are we supposed to do? Give them something to drink. And I mean, a good, clean, clear, good drink, not poison water. Huh? Because in doing this, in doing this, we will heat burning coals of fire upon them. It says, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. <clears throat> Forgiveness should be and needs to be the goal of every Christian. It is the only way that we can be free and capable of doing the good that God has instructed us to do. Forgiveness is letting go. Letting go of our right to get somebody back. Forgiveness is making a choice between whether we will spend our lives seeking revenge whether we'll move forward in spite of the wrong that has been done, trusting in God to see us through. Forgiveness allows us to free ourselves up from the mental prison that we are locked up in and to be strengthened by the power of the Holy Spirit that carries us in spite of somebody else's wrong. There are many scriptures in the Bible that instruct us on forgiveness, but the Joseph story in Genesis is, in my opinion, one of the best illustrations of how the process of forgiveness can be walked out. Because forgiveness is indeed a process. 
Joseph was the son of Jacob, Abraham's son, and Rachel. Joseph was one of the favored sons, along with his brother Benjamin, uh, for his mother and father. We just have to be clear about that. He was a favorite. That's just how it was at that time and how it is sometimes now. Joseph was the son of promise to Jacob and Rachel, and, and the woman he, who was the woman he truly loved. He was the son of privilege, the son who was so special in their eyes that his mother made him a special coat of many colors. And he wore it proudly in front of all of his brothers and his sisters. Why did he do that? Now the story goes that these brothers were indeed jealous of Joseph, especially when he told them that God had shown him a vision and that all of them would bow down to him one day. You're kind of not supposed to share that. <laughs> now to be sure, Joseph didn't seem to be trying to rub this in the face of his brothers. Nor was he trying to boast or brag, but Joseph was so excited about the vision God told him that he ran and told the only people he really knew. And we know from our studies that the brothers were so jealous of him that they sought to destroy him. First, they left him in a pit, assuming that he would be eaten by wild animals. And then they offered him up and sold him to some random Egyptians who came along the road who would take him into slavery and use him for whatever they pleased. Fast forwarding through the story after much turmoil, difficulty, and suffering, a false accusation that landed Joseph in jail for about two years came, and there was no obvious way that he would get out. Joseph endured and later was raised to a position of prominence and power in the Pharaoh's house, the king of Egypt, to the second in command over all of Egypt, and his brothers were forced to go before him in need of food in order to live in the time of famine in that land. One of the first messages we want to take away from this story is that whenever we do somebody wrong, we need to believe God when God says he will repay us for that wrong. The people we think we don't need, or the people we don't like, or the people we are envious of, or the ones we want to destroy, know that God sees it all, and that God will hold us to account for all that we have done. The scripture tells us that what is done in the dark will indeed come out in the light. Further, we learn that the very one that we seek to turn away might be the one we will desperately need someday. The old saying goes, be careful how you treat people along the way. Well, the brothers, unbeknownst to them, needed their brother Joseph. They didn't know that was Joseph, and they went to Egypt in dire need of help and met up with uh, their own brother who was the only one who could provide the help that they needed in the time of famine. When we meet Joseph now in command of Egypt, we learn some very significant things about him from this story. And the story is laid out in chapter 37. If you've not read it, you should read the entirety of it. But we learn that Joseph never sought revenge against his brothers for what they had done. Joseph spared his brothers the embarrassment and the pain of being found out as the ones who sought to destroy Joseph. Joseph played along with them, and he helped them. Joseph treated his brothers like he would anybody else who came to the Pharaoh's house in need of grain to eat and to live during this time of famine. Joseph acted as if nothing ever happened. Joseph, like Jesus, looked beyond their faults, and he saw their needs. Now, to be sure, Joseph, as you know, did play a few games with his brothers along the way. But Joseph walked out the forgiveness process in a way that we can all learn from. Remember when his brothers wondered aloud back in, in, for those who, in chapter 42, when they weren't sure that this ruler didn't know yet that it was Joseph, but they weren't sure what he was going to do, they started wondering out loud. They started feeling guilty. They wondered what he was, was going to do with them, and they were afraid, and they said to one another, surely we are being punished because of our brother. We saw how distressed he was when he pleaded with us for his life, but we would not listen. That's why this distress has come on us. That's why this is happening to us. And then the one brother Reuben said, didn't I tell you not to sin against the boy? I'm talking about Joseph. But you wouldn't listen. Now we must give an accounting for his blood. 
And at the sound of these words, the scripture says, as Joseph overheard them, he wept. The brothers finally began to feel the sting of the wrong they had done. They thought Joseph was long gone, destroyed, torn apart by animals, or used up dead. But they were personally convicted in this moment. They were in desperate need of food, and they determined that they were being punished for their wrongful acts. Romans 12 says, it speaks somewhat to what happens uh, when we don't seek revenge on somebody. Uh, it says, if it, as we said earlier, if someone is hungry, give them something to eat. But if they're thirsty, give them something to drink. For by so doing, you will heap coals of fire upon their head. By the way Joseph acted, he was heaping coals of fire on their head. They were feeling the, the pain, probably for the first time as to what they had done to their brother. You do know that some people think they can kill you and just go on with their life and put it behind them. You, you do know, at least at the time. Don't get me wrong, Joseph was not a superman or a perfect saint. He was not a man with no feeling and no ability to experience pain. I am sure Joseph was dealing with the pain and the suffering he had endured because of the acts of his brother right in the moment that he was blessing them. They hurt him. They didn't care for him. He must have felt that all alone. No, we don't know exactly how he felt, but we can certainly imagine how he must have felt when he was forced to go to jail for a crime he didn't commit. And we can imagine how he must have felt when he was thrown into that dungeon and there was no date for a court hearing to see if he was guilty or innocent. And we certainly must be able to imagine how desperate he must have felt when he begged that cupbearer to please, please get me an audience before the Pharaoh so I can interpret his dream like I did yours. And maybe, just maybe, he will show me some favor. This is Joseph who had received a vision from God that all of his brothers and so many would bow down to him in the dungeon trying to claw his way out. We don't know from scripture exactly how he felt, but we do know what it's like when somebody you love hurts you. When somebody causes you to have to endure some pain and suffering that you never deserved. All because they might be jealous of you or just plain selfish. I can imagine Joseph had many sleepless nights replaying in his mind what his brothers had done to him and finding it hard to believe that they could be so callous, so uncaring, and so unloving as to leave him for dead in the hands of the enemy. But yet, when Joseph came face to face with his brothers, something in Joseph had already solidified, and he didn't seek revenge upon them. But instead, he sought to regain that which he had lost in his family. So he provided for his other brothers as if they had never harmed him. Joseph had already decided in his spirit that it is time to forgive. It was not a time for revenge, but a time for forgiveness. And Joseph never wavered. He didn't try to ambush them or to trick them into a situation that they couldn't get out of, just like they had done with him. He provided for all of them, and he held them close to him until he revealed who he truly was. Each time Joseph encountered them, he was letting go of the past and seeking instead to move toward a better future. He was making a bold choice to do what was right so that he could have peace in his own heart. Instead of focusing on what was done to him that was wrong, he was giving up that right to get back at somebody, but blessing them in a way that even they were not comfortable with it. He was overcoming evil with good. Oh, the brothers knew full well that they had done wrong. And by this time, they also knew that eventually they would have to pay. But God used Joseph in this, in this story to teach his brothers 
and all of us a valuable lesson. God teaches us all that forgiveness is a decision we make to choose good over evil. And the time for forgiveness is always right now. While the blood is still running warm in your veins, while you still have the activity of your limbs and the functioning of all of your faculties, the time of forgiveness is always right now. It is time to seek to not meet evil with evil, but evil with good. You see, if Joseph had tried to harm them, then Joseph would be no better than them. Yeah. Let me say that again. If Joseph, the wronged one, had tried to harm them, then guess what? He becomes just like them in the eyes of God. Joseph said that God used the harm that they tried to cause him, and God turned it around for the good of the saving of many lives to get Joseph to a place where he could be in a position to touch lives in a godly way and to bless people. God opened doors for Joseph just like he promised him in the vision that he gave him so many years. God opened doors for Joseph <laughs> based on Joseph's gifts. God placed Joseph before great men. He didn't claw his way to the top. He didn't beat somebody else down trying to get to the top. He was obedient to God. tried to harm him, God could still use Joseph in a mighty way. Joseph was well-loved, respected, and honored in Pharaoh's house and in Pharaoh's kingdom amongst the Egyptians. Pharaoh allowed Joseph to make the decisions about who would eat and who would not. Hallelujah. God was faithful to Joseph in a way that everything God showed him in the vision came to pass. This wasn't easy for Joseph by no stretch of the imagination. That is why he wept so much. This was very difficult to allow yourself to be vulnerable once again at the hands of the ones who hurt you and whose only goal seemed to destroy you. But Joseph looked beyond what they had done and he looked instead at what God had promised him. Because what God has promised is bigger and far more significant than any wrong that any person can ever do. What is the moral of the story? It is not our responsibility to try to right every wrong done to us. Some wrongs have to be given over to God and we have to allow God to fight those battles. And if you've ever done it and you've seen how God can fix it, You'll never seek to tamper in God's business again. What has God called you to? Forgive or who has God called you to forgive? And what is hindering you, if anything, from fulfilling that call to forgive? Are you saddled by feelings of unforgiveness? Do you have a monkey on your back that just won't leave you alone because you have so much anger and resentment towards someone for something they did? These are real questions. We learned at the very start of this year, 2017, that we must break those habits that don't serve to move us forward. We must rid ourselves of anger and bitterness and seek to love and show compassion just as Jesus did. For when, <laughs> for when we do, remember when you forgive, you heal. And when you let go, you grow. And then you are in a position to reach somebody and teach somebody something. Amen? Brothers and sisters, it's time to forgive. It's time to forgive. That time is right now. But know that forgiveness is a process. Forgiveness involves some struggle and yes, sometimes some pain. 
but forgiveness is achievable. If we can let go and let God be God in our lives. Dr. James Forbes from the Riverside Church in New York City once said, it is impossible to achieve in anger and revenge what your soul is longing for because your soul longs for peace. Joseph let go, I'm gonna skip some of this. Joseph let go and he did not pursue the need to get back. Now I wish that we could just end there and set this one aside as a model of forgiveness that we should all memorize and practice. But life is never that easy. Remember, Joseph was a product of a line of deception and a lack of integrity and greed. And because of that, many of those traits carried through in his family and among his children and his children's children. His brothers probably carried a lot of resentment because Joseph was a favored child among all the children and the parents made it clear to all of them and that should never be. No child should ever feel that their brother or sister is better than them in the eyes of their parents. We still do that today. But Joseph signaled a turn. He broke, he broke that down. He signaled a turn. A focus away from self, but toward God. To a position where God could use him to bless many lives. I mentioned earlier that I was struck yesterday by all the prayer requests that came through, so many, and they were all talking about prayer for families. During the season of Advent, we want to lift up families. We want to ask God for guidance and deliverance and healing in our families. We want to restore hope in our families that whatever the enemy means for evil, God can indeed get the glory if we will allow God to work in and through us. That God can make the crooked places straight. That God can bring us together in a way that is unmistakably God. Joseph said, don't be afraid. Am I in the position of God? You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good. This is the word of the Lord, brothers and sisters. Thanks.